Welcome to uh, this uh, discussion group on how we can progress. The Power House kindly hosted and put together by Squire Pat and Boggs. It's not the only law in the North of England, but it is the best. Um, and uh, it's great to have Nick Hedlum, Ben Houch and Dermont and Susan and other colleagues with us today. <laughs> who is with me next to me one meter apart as you can see we measured it with a yardstick and we just hope today is an opportunity to talk about some of the policies that are going to drive forward the north of england over the uh, months to come um if people have questions they can put them in the q a section and i will attempt to get through them um but however i thought we have some questions that i've just scribbled down as the former uh, Northern Powerhouse Minister, which I just think would be an interesting way of getting it started. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Ben Houchin, if I, I may, down the line, Ben, if you could come off mute. Um, because, of course, obviously, there's a real crisis point at the moment in terms of economic growth and the challenges around coronavirus. But that seems to be something you are managing to buck the trend of in the Tees Valley. And I wonder if you could say, how important has devolution been in terms of securing that long-term jobs growth and employment growth that you are continuing to see in the Tees Valley despite the coronavirus? Well, I suppose I would say this, uh, wouldn't I? But I think it's been, I think it's been absolutely crucial. Uh, so many people say to me, you know, you must have been affected by coronavirus. How are you dealing with things? And, you know, what, what's been disrupted as a result? But actually, we, we haven't seen any disruption whatsoever. And I think... That's largely because of how devolution is currently set up. Um, in effect, combined authorities and elected metro mayors are just directly elected and politically accountable RDAs. So we replace the regional development agencies with a transition through LEPs. So really my job is to bring investment, create jobs, try and push economic growth. And one of the benefits of that, speaking very frankly, is that I don't have the responsibility of potholes, emptying people's bins, social services. And as a result, actually I have Technically, while I do get involved, I don't actually have a direct role over the response to coronavirus. While many of the local authorities do get me involved, it's not my responsibility. So it's still a very focused organisation. And even with everything that's going on, the staff that we have and the departments we have are still focused on, well, even in these most difficult of times, how do we continue to make progress on those big projects? And I think it's absolutely fair to say that without devolution, a lot of the stuff that we're working on and have done over the last six, eight months would have stopped. Uh, much of it wouldn't have started, uh, but it's absolutely right to say that, you know, we can do a lot of the heavy lifting on the future and forward looking economy, while the local authorities are in an extremely difficult place of how do we deal with the pandemic. So I think it's um, as well as fiscal powers, as well as what the government have done to set us up. It's also about focus and mindset and, you know, what is this organisation there to do compared to others? And I think that's played a positive role in being able to, to continue to make progress in all honesty, pretty unabated from the start of the pandemic to today. Thanks, Ben. And um, just sort of coming into that, what additional powers, before I come to the Minister, Simon Clark, what additional powers do you think would be helpful as a, a Metro Mayor leading one of our most successful combined authority areas? And uh, what sort of powers, you know, they're gonna be a bit mature, aren't they? Because you've been doing this for several years now, it's an election next May. So do you think there's going to be a difference between the powers that you have and can use as a, as a mature, developed, uh, combined authority with the mayor as head of it, and the, and the powers that maybe should come to new areas delivering on that prime ministerial ambition to have devolution across the north of England? Yeah, well, I think, you know, our next push is for, for further powers. There's some really kind of obvious and technical ones around the planning legislation, some of the national planning um, procedures could be devolved locally. We actually think that that slows us down rather than speeds them up. So some really interesting things that I think are unique to Teesside that we could take devolution um, over. I think there's an interesting conversation about fiscal devolution for regions and whether that works on a on a, on a regional level, never mind on a, on a UK wide basis with the devolved administrations. But um, I think that's slightly further away. But the one for me, I think there are two points to it. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we get devolution for the whole of the country. Um, it's all very well and good having metro mayors that cover part of it, but actually having a collective of mayors that cover the whole of the country will be a much more powerful thing when making representations to government uh, from a standing point of view. 
But I, going to your point, Jake, you know, what is what are the powers of this organisation look like compared to new or new deals that may be coming down the line? They're going to be vastly different, and and rightly so, to be honest. I, I mean, if I was a government minister, I wouldn't set up a brand new combined authority and give it the same powers that I've got or Andy Burnham's got or you know um, Sheffield City Region now have, because the, the term that I like to use is it's with devolution, it's about earned autonomy. I mean, if you show progress with the powers that you've got and you show you can deal with the powers that you've got and you can deal with them sensibly, then government kind of say, well, you've proven yourself, so we're going to give you a bit more and we're going to give you a bit more. And I think setting up a new organisation and just dumping a lot of powers on them means that the whole system would fall over. And there's a very then, there's a, there's a government point of view that they've got to take that if you give too many powers to a brand new devolved area on day one and it falls over, you know, you're not at the stage where you can say, well, that's the mayor's fault. Actually, it's government's fault for, for not setting up the deals correctly in a proportionate way. So absolutely, we're pushing on to the next stage, which is why it was so crucial for areas like Teesside, obviously Manchester, and the first wave of deals to get over the line, because you will all, always have that head start. Because as people are moving through different phases, you're moving on to the next phase and you're moving on to the next phase. So hopefully we can stay ahead of the curve, but it depends, um, as I'm sure we'll hear from the minister shortly, uh, what, what the next phase actually looks like. Well, Minister, we've heard it there, haven't we? A, a multi-track approach, earned autonomy. Um, perhaps you could um, talk about some of the powers that Ben's highlighted. And then also, if you could lift the veil slightly on this new devolution framework that's coming up. And then I'm going to come to Nick Headlam uh, when the Minister's spoken to just talk about what further powers she would like to see. I'll just turn the laptop towards you. Thank you very much, Jake. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to, uh, to join you. Obviously, this is a very exciting moment for devolution. Ben alludes, we are... Uh, in the business now of trying to make sure that we end the asymmetry which has characterised our devolution uh, arrangements for the last several years and make sure that we do, uh, over time, move to uh, as close to national coverage as we can. And I think it's an exciting proposition because we've seen the difference that good mayors make. And you know, there's no question, I, I mean, I'm a Teesside MP myself, I am biased, but uh, what Ben has done in the Tees Valley matters, resonates with the public, is driving out performance relative to anything that has gone before, and is a model for why uh, devolution can really lift the life chances of people in areas which need levelling up. This is not an adjunct to the government's agenda. This is central to the mission of what it is uh, this government is trying to achieve in domestic politics. That is to say, uh, improving our infrastructure, improving our skill system, making sure that powers and funding sit as close to local decision makers as they can. And uh, the, the white paper that's coming up this autumn will therefore be an attempt to summarise our ambitions uh, for uh, onward devolution. And clearly, uh, as we've discussed, uh, there, are, there, are, there are two elements to this. One, establishing more mayoralties, but uh, also looking at how we can widen and deepen the power of, of those mayoralties that already uh, exist. And so what been talking about there about additional powers is, is genuinely interesting something which we'll, we are looking at very closely uh, there's there's a lot of work that needs to go into this because obviously this is a big modal shift in the way government works uh britain uh, and england in particular have been one of the most heavily centralized states uh in in the west for a very long time and i think uh the regional disparities which exist are partly the result of that. We have not done well enough for too long in terms of uh, equalising things like productivity between the different regions of the UK. The only city outside London that outperforms on productivity currently is Bristol. It's not good enough. We've got to do better. We've got to, rather than just sort of piously hoping things will change, we've got to put in place the structures that will enable that change uh, to happen. So the powers that we have granted mayors are genuinely uh, substantive. Uh, clearly, we do want to look at going further. We want to look at making sure we can unlock, for example, the planning uh, reforms that we want to see. We want to get the house building uh, that's so badly needed in large parts of the country. We want to make sure uh, that we have a roadmap for exploring new and exciting post-Brexit propositions like free ports. We want to ensure that this country has strong champions who can be voices for their regions at the top table uh, in a way which council leaders, frankly, have never been able uh, to do. However able they may be, they just don't have the heft behind them in those conversations with government. 
that a directly elected mayor does. And that is, of course, why we're willing to uh, devolve more powers. And the principle, as you alluded, Ben, of earned autonomy will, of course, continue to underlie uh, our wider uh, prospectus. If, if mayors show that they are uh, capable uh, decision makers and, and as their institutions mature, of course, we want to see what more we can uh, we can give to uh, to you in, in order to uh, take things to the next level. Because the one thing uh, I know for certain is that this mission won't begin and end in this parliament. It will last uh, decades. Uh, that is, you know, that is the mission we face. We're not going to turn an area like, for example, Merseyside round overnight. But we've got to start somewhere, and we've got to will the means. And that's uh, absolutely where this government is, and it's exciting to be part of it. I saw a board of round people. I, I'm disappointed that it's not our ambition to send this uh, <laughs> round overnight, although I think we're making great steps. I'm going to bring in Nick Headlam now. Nick was uh, formerly at the department involved in doing the Northern Powerhouse strategy. But Nick, one of the questions has also come in from our audience, uh, which I think is really interesting and will play very well to the work you are doing and have done. And that's really not just on devolution, but how should innovation drive the Northern Powerhouse and what's the opportunity for the, for the government, for mayors, for business to really be a central part of that? Um, well, thank you very much, Jake, and thank you, Minister Clark. Um, I guess everybody's been a bit reflective over this lockdown period, thinking about some of the really big things. And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot the early meeting in the beginning of the Blair um, government, the first one, we went with a lot of council leaders to Downing Street. And afterwards, Tony Blair said, can you not get me a better class of lobbyist? And I said, I'm terribly sorry, this is elected local government. And I don't think that would happen now, because if you go mob handed with Ben Houchen, Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, to Andy Street has been a very impressive, um, even this week on the stabbing. So, so that's been one thing in, in, in that 20 year period. We've got some amazing, uh, strong mayors in local government. However, as that government found, and, and John Healy, who used to do a similar job uh, to the minister, he told me that um, local government reform is a fourth term issue for any government, because you start doing things, you find you don't have the structures, you reform, you spend, you know, it goes sort of bit, you know, in the middle bit. And that's one thing that I find interesting is that it is the fourth term of a Conservative government, if you count the coalition, which I do. And you've kind of got there in terms of a structural, uh, the, the forthcoming structural work. Now, I would say that Nobody ever wants to talk about structure, which is why having a PhD in the structure of economic development has been a lonely business over time. But I absolutely believe, um, and as we, we banged the drum for within the Northern Powerhouse strategy process, that innovation is the core of a Northern strategy value proposition. Because it doesn't matter what you look at, if you look at Net Zero North for clean energy, if you look at the role of cultural and heritage organizations in a shaping place, there is fantastic innovation happening in the North. And the, the, the role of government and the role of the M9 and the role of the MP11 has been to pull all that together to make some sense of a pan-regional footprint, which again is troublesome because you've got each layer of structure all at once kind of changing uh, uh, and, and needing reform. And I'm encouraged to hear from Ben that the economic development of Teesside hasn't been affected much by the pandemic because some of the numbers that I've been crunching over the summer do look like there are um, the spatial and social consequences of the pandemic we need to do more on. But our whole premise that there was a transformative northern case that was just within reach still remains. But the socio-spatial consequences of the pandemic we need to think through a bit more. And I would argue that the most important function that's missing, and I would say this, wouldn't I, is an evidence-based observatory gathering thinking entity at the northern level would be brilliant. And Annette has asked the question, the NA obviously will be a key partner in that, but all, you know, all the universities of the north and all the sort of skills providers of the north, innovation can run all the way through um, any notion of, of progressing the powerhouse. 
Fantastic. Well, I think uh, it's probably a, a good point to bring Dermot in. Uh, any comments in terms of, you know, how, how how we can play a role in that? So, I mean, I I, I do um, agree with, with with what Nicholas just said about the importance of innovation. Um, I mean, I do think obviously the Northern Powerhouse has been, you know, a, an evolving work in progress for 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 some years now. Uh, but I, I I think not wanting to be a party pooper, but I, I think with the combination of the pandemic on top of Brexit, that we are entering an extremely challenging time for the UK as a whole, but we won't be immune to it up here, far from it. So I, I think it really the onus is on us as a region to respond to that in a, in a proactive and positive way that will you know, mitigate the, um, the impact. And I, so I, I think you know, things that are going on at the moment around but at UK level and northern level, in terms of you know, at the UK level, working on the free trade agreement, of course, with the EU, and we'll see what happens there. But also with Japan and the US, I think that will be very important. I think things like you know the free ports initiative, particularly the Tees Valley proposal, which I thought was outstanding, is is exactly the kind of proactive work that we need to do. I think just to stand still, unfortunately. So we need to be doing more of that. Um, and it all centers around innovation. These are creating structures around which the, this region can take advantage of the opportunities of an innovative, uh, you know, agglomerate slash hub economy. And so I think, I think, you know, we're doing what we should be doing, but we need to be doing more. Fantastic. Well, you almost knew that I was going to talk about uh, free ports next. You didn't, but I just when I was on mute, I said to the minister, we're going to come on to free ports next time. I, I wonder if, if Susan would like to comment about the, the role that this deregulation, low tax environment can play in driving the northern economy, that opportunity of free ports. And I agree what a fantastic proposal we've seen from the Tees Valley. It certainly has my 110% backing. It was a brilliant piece of work. Um, but, you know, there are some challenges, uh, but how can we place the North at the sort of vanguard of productivity and internationalisation as a way of driving our economy? Yeah, good morning. A pleasure to be here. Um, I think um, I'm just going to start with actually a, a, an example, because with through the pandemic, we were doing a bit of consultation with some of our freight uh, members. And one thing that came very um, a bit of a shock for us was when we were looking at how trade was happening during this pandemic and finding out that for some of our companies, actually sending their goods was cheaper via Heathrow than sending them through our own airports uh, network. And when we asked how is, is that even possible? I mean, we are, we are closer, you know, it's, 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 it's geographically in theory, a no-brainer, but somehow the South and the Heathrow, uh, how they are operating is far more advanced. The technology, the, the way the logistics are working actually works cheaper. And I think if we want to compete and we want to have free ports in the North, really bring in our investment, uh, help us with uh, more competitive supply chain and export, export increase, then we need to really, uh, inject investment on technology on the also on the knowledge uh, capability base we think we uh, i think it's been mentioned over and over uh, on, on the news that with uh, all that is happening we're going to see a huge increase on customs requirements for companies uh, trading with the eu and it's expected that we're going to go from 50 million customs declarations just for an example to 250 million that's a huge increase and even if we have some of the freight operators saying that they are, you know, ready for this change, the reality is that they are going to bring more complications and the level of knowledge, both within our own companies and some of the intermediary business support organization remains relatively low uh, because we didn't have to do all this before um, when we were part of the EU. So I think investing on technology, things like blockchain, AI, things like that, reducing custom requirements and making sure that the criteria is flexible enough to attract the right 
accepted of companies into these reports is going to be crucial uh, to see uh, a real impact in our local economy. Well, Minister, we, we need investments in technology. I'm really interested to hear your comments on this report before I come to the Mayor of the Tees Valley, Ben Houchin, for a comment about how, how what he needs and how it can be done. Minister Clark. Thanks, Jay. Can you that? The report composition is enormously exciting. I think it's, it's, it is a litmus test of whether or not we are going to take the opportunities that Brexit undoubtedly represents to reset our trade policy. The UK has always been a, a, a great trading nation. I think uh, we should be very ambitious in this space. And obviously, uh, as we create free ports, and I very much hope that the uh, the outcome of the, of the, uh, the consultation that's ongoing will will lead to rapid progress uh, in this regard. I believe that they are, well, they, they are both national hubs of trade and enterprise, but they're also a signal, I think, of, of serious intent for us to uh, provide new opportunities and in new places, potentially, uh, where opportunity, uh, you know, since the 1980s has been much more limited than anyone would like. So we would want them to attract new businesses, uh, spread jobs, investment and opportunity. And do so in a way which is genuinely additional. I think one of the fears within government about initiatives like Freeports has been what they would term that they simply displace activity. I think that's a very negative uh, interpretation of what they can do. I think they can capture new uh, business opportunities from abroad, and that must certainly be uh, our mantra. And with that in mind, I certainly support a fairly maximalist interpretation of what it is that we ought to be driving for here. There's no point in doing a policy like this, but doing it in a half-hearted way. Uh, the, the, the free ports should come with meaningful incentives for businesses to locate there. Uh, and obviously, yes, in a world where we don't yet know uh, the full nature of the uh, eventual future agreement or not that we reach with the European Union. Uh, but in any scenario, there is likely to be a degree of more friction at the border than we have now. And therefore, that something like this has a potential to be uh, genuinely important, I think, and uh, does additionally apply a degree of pressure in those ongoing talks that the UK does have options here, which we intend to pursue, uh, and therefore increases our leverage in, in the negotiations. Well, thank you, Mr. Then we've heard lots of praise of the proposals coming out of the, the Tees Valley. We all have uh, great hopes um, that we will hear more about the free ports across the United Kingdom and uh, hopefully in the Tees Valley as well. Um, if you could just comment about how you think it could drive your economy. If you recall, Ben, we stood in front of the free port in Hong Kong together and you said this is what the Tees Valley will be like in a few years. Um, I'll just let my clock finish. We're halfway there on the session. Um, so, Ben, perhaps if you could comment and I will go on to mute. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, it, it, it's actually, Freeport's a really interesting example of where devolution has worked because what devolution brings, just before I move on to the Freeport bit, is, is competition actually between regions. Because if you're giving more power and autonomy and money to a region to make its own decisions, then it needs to start thinking in a serious way rather than just forever be bidding into government pots of, well, what are we actually good at and what's the future of our region look like? And I think that's helped us, for example, specialise. And I think that does lead to specialisation within regions. So, you know, we're never going to compete with Manchester when it comes to digital. And in all honesty, Manchester is never going to compete with us when it comes to chemical and processing. So you start to leverage the things that you're good at, reinforce you know, the existing businesses that you have. And then you think, well, how do you then drive that forward? So as well as then creating competition between regions, it also creates, I think, more creativity in policy making as well. So you actually find that rather than Whitehall having, you know, the you know the golden key to to all of the ideas in the world, actually you all of a sudden get regions coming forward with policies and saying this would benefit us in X way, which is what Freeports did for for Teesside. I mean, the details of a Freeport on Teesside would be would be absolutely astronomical. The, the uh, economic analysis that we've done with with a company called Vivid Economics, a very well respected economics firm, um, shows that uh, we could see the creation of 32,000 jobs if Teesside got itself a free pot. Um, that's huge. That's all additional jobs on top of what is expected over the next 15 to 20 year period. 
it could see more than two to two and a half billion pounds of GVA added to the local economy. I mean, the impacts would just be absolutely phenomenal. And what's really interesting about any port policy, including a UK wide free port policy, is free ports, because rather than free zones, we talk about free ports, because I think as a phase one, they should absolutely be located around ports or potentially some airports as well. That what you actually get is a huge investment in the bottom quarter percentile of local authority areas. So if the government wants to deliver on its levelling up agenda and if Boris wants to do what he says he was going to do at the election, actually Freeport is a perfect example of that because disproportionately they benefit the lower quarter percentile of local authority areas in the country where un unemployment is disproportionately uh, high compared to other areas. So it's a real levelling up um, ambition. I think you know some of the things that I think we should be seeing in, in free in free ports, which hopefully the Chancellor will announce um, in the not too distant future, I think we could see a significant increase or potentially uncapping of things like capital allowances. We could see a reduction or abolition in things like national insurance contributions, both employer and employee. I mean, in a, in a utopian world, I would love to see a, a reduction, if not abolition of corporation tax within the zone, which can be managed actually to make sure that you're not just moving um, taxation from the UK into a, in effect a, a slight offshoring, because that can be protected about which industries actually attract the benefits of a free port. Um, I think there's some really interesting stuff, not just about um, reduction in tax, but things like uh, incentives to stimulate uh, development and innovation. So potentially the increase of things like research and development tax credits within zones to really drive innovation within the regions as well. Uh, so I think all of those are things are really important. I think Susanna also hit the nail on the head that not all of this is just about deregulation and taxation or, or reduction of taxation. It's also about if you can set up a small number of very highly specialist free zones, then what that will bring is it will bring the technology that, let's be honest, already exists around the world. The biggest problem we have with our imports and exports in this country is we've been lazy because we don't have to do any of it. Most of it's still paper-based. Shipping companies are still you know, producing uh, paper-based documents. That's going to a freight forwarder. That's going into customs. I mean, if you go to Jebel Ali, which is always the, the benchmark that we set ourselves against, you know, why, has, why couldn't the UK have a Jebel Ali free port? Of course it could. But the technology is already being used there for automation of product automatic processing of customs arrangements, they're already onto phases two and three, which is where I think we should be in the next five or 10 years, where you have virtual free zones where you can put something on a truck and you can drive it between the Jebel Ali port to the airport. And while both are not connected by a landmass, actually they are still outside of the territory for taxation purposes while it moves between the zones. All of this stuff exists. And this is, I think what free ports will do is catalyze the conversation within government of, well, actually, we probably should have thought about this some time ago, and now it's going to create a huge amount of work to get us up to the where, where the, in all honesty, the rest of the world already is. Thank you, Ben. I, I'm going to. I, I think we're having really getting under the skin of this issue now. There's just a, a couple of points I make. It's great to hear about how we're going to create these jobs, um, but if everywhere is taken to the taxation net, there is going to be a bit of a question that our colleague Rishi Sunak will have about how do we pay for it. That's just one to think about. But as well as free ports, of course, and not every area is going to be able to have a free port because uh, you know, places do occasionally have to pay tax. Um, uh, there's a real opportunity, of course, coming forward for the North of England in these trade deals. And I'm, I'm going to go round the group. I'm going to go to Susanna first, then Dermot, and then Nick, and then back to Ben before I give the minister an opportunity to respond, to ask about Okay, free ports are up there, but we accept we can't have them everywhere. What are those top asks that we want to see in the trade negotiations as we leave the European Union at the end of this year? Are there territorial asks which you think the North should be pushing for? Are they sectoral asks or are they particular tax breaks? And it would be unfair to expect the Minister to respond uh, on the hoof to them all, but I just think it's worthwhile as on behalf of the North of England really logging that to make sure that the North of England can have its voice heard. And Simon Cock, of course, is the person to do that. So I'll start with you, Susanna. Uh, yes, definitely, obviously, tariffs. Uh, we've been trading. I mean, let's not forget that despite since the referendum, the EU remains uh, still one of our largest economic blocks for both export imports and, and our support of investment. So tariffs uh, obviously are an important part of it. We also need to kind of push more on the service sector. This is one that has been growing in terms of for us year on year. 
uh, it's where a lot of the expertise from the whole UK and the region lies. But I also think, I mean, when we come to goods uh, specifically, uh, we are seeing some serious challenges for some of the sectors, uh, especially when it comes to rules of origin and preferential or non-preferential access to some of those um, things and how that will impact the supply chain. We, we know that automotive chemicals have given various examples how you know, components and processes are happening across the pan-European supply chain. And we need to ensure that we, we safeguard uh, those jobs, uh, those processes to make it as easy as possible. Obviously, there will be some changes and friction. That, that's, that's just the nature of what we're going through. But we need to ensure that the government plays those um, issues at the heart of their negotiations uh, alongside with the, you know, the, tra the tariffs uh, and all. All sorts, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I guess if um, to agree with, with everything Susanna said, uh, I mean, I think it, it, you mentioned territory and products. I mean, obviously, the EU, whether we like it or not, is still is by far the biggest single trading partner of the of the UK. So I, I, I think. The focus should be, and I, th I think is to a certain extent, in in doing as good a deal as we can get with them. Um, now, it's not clear whether there will be any deal, and so I think I think rightfully that you know the government needs to also be focusing on on other countries. And I mean the obvious ones, I think, for the north and for the whole country are are the other big economies in the world. So starting with the U.S., which actually is. In terms of, it is the single largest trading country with the, with the UK. So that would be great. I understand Japan is 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 almost a done deal, and so again, that's one of the other big economies, places like Mexico, Canada, and so on. So so I think they should be the focus, and my understanding is they are the focus. Um, and th those are four kind of comprehensive trade deals. I mean, as as Susanna said, there are certain. Product areas, which where the north is a particular strength. I mean, chemicals has been mentioned, um, you know, farm and so on, and 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 so obviously we would hope that they would be included, um, and and these are really are essential to give. I, I think the keyword is incentives for businesses to go and take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. And as I said earlier on, if we don't do that, particularly if there's no deal in the with the EU. We are going to get a very bloody nose. So, so now is the time to be to be focusing on this. Hello. So I had loads to say on free ports, but I guess I'll, with the conversations moved on now, it's, it's really rich because obviously I wanted to get in on various things. I would say, of course, on free ports, chapter and verse is the excellent Centre for Policy Studies pamphlet by, uh, I don't know what happened to the author of that, some, you know, some, some Rishi Sunak. I would just like to, I had a question written in the chat to Ben about how, with his focus on the airport and the free port, he's starting to develop a real infrastructure-led strategy. And I've been frustrated about a lack of comparative work, as in understanding how Antwerp and, and Hamburg and Panamax and all those things, it's all about connectivity, not just things come into the T's, it's then where do they then go? So lo lots of discussions on free ports, but that wasn't what I wanted to say. There was a thing in the chat about whether, like the way that we're meeting now is going to change work forever it's from uh, Tim Davison. And this, I think, gets right to the core of what we're talking about, because he's asking, do, does he think that people will um, flock to, talent will flock to London through flexible working arrangements? And I I think the jury is massively out because everything about where we live and where we work and what we want, where we go for fun, I think is up for question at the moment. And it's not a settled thing. So, you know, whilst we have to keep banging the drum for um, Northern Power Rail, HS3, whatever you want to call it, there needs to be fast rail across the north. That is a hill that we should die on in terms of connectivity. Um, what do you know the entire middle class has been in their kitchen their buttery or their pantry since march with no appreciable difference to their working life apart from their um you know in fact yesterday when i came on jake said i looked well i was like yeah not traveling to london is like the best thing that's ever happened to me i was in london you know two days a fortnight the, the previous year 
And and um, for me, I think this is why we need to get the exact ask and offer right around the black place branding. And as I said, the cultural assets, because you would be mad to want to relocate to London, even in public affairs, politics and all the rest of it. It's, I think it really does open up far more distributed patterns of where people live and work and how they get between them. But of course, that means at the same time as reforming the planning system, that the outcomes of that reform are, are kind of shifting. So um, I just wanted to put a, plan, a, a pin in that as a sort of as a planner. Um, the way in which we reform the planning system is so far from arcane. It's it gives the fuel to all the things that we've been talking about. Um, what else? Oh yeah, the other thing was yeah. So I, I'm a freelancer, so I'm allowed to define my own. Uh, operation and i've been saying for the last year i don't do brexit and i don't do yorkshire they're both too hard but having said all of that um the the tumult and the t and the we have to look at the the the, co the lockdown and covid as um as a restructuring of the economy again and but we need to be on the front foot in understanding as i say not just at the level of individuals like to, you know, personal preference, where do you live and work, but how the sectors are affected, how the supply chains are affected. And as I say, more research is needed in terms of how a government intervention can fuel the regeneration and the economic development outcomes that we need. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Nate. And um, briefly, Ben, and I'll give the, the Minister the opportunity to comment. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast from the audience. We're going to work through them in the last bit of our session. So, Ben, if you could briefly list your top ask. I know that you're talking to each other on a daily basis anyway, uh, and then give the Minister the opportunity to respond to some of those excellent points. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jake. Um, well, obviously, number one on the list is free ports. I just think people underestimate. They, they see it as a bit of a the people who aren't involved in the detail, people see it as a bit of a an abstract concept. But the thing that it will catalyze to completely change a region, potentially the UK, if rolled out properly, is is just off off the chart. And I think it's um, it's important to recognize it's not about tax tape because where Freeport should actually work, and this is the work that went after the Centre of Policy Studies uh, work that Rishi did, is Freeport should largely be focused around regeneration areas. Because then what you're not doing is you're not, you're not, you're not displacing taxation. You're not even foregoing taxation within an area that's already doing well. So my argument has always been, you're not even foregoing My argument has always been that you wouldn't have a free port in Felixstowe. You wouldn't have one really, if it was up to me in places like Liverpool or the London Gateway, because they're already very successful port areas. What you need is large areas of land that are brownfield areas with no, no economic activity at the minute. And it's how you stimulate that. Uh, so I think free ports are absolutely essential. I think investment in infrastructure, as uh, as, as Nic Nicola was just saying, I think if you get the infrastructure right, whether that's port infrastructure, we do airports as well, obviously, you get infrastructure like roads and things like free ports, which is a type of infrastructure, then to some extent, you don't really need to second guess where the future of the economy is going, even post COVID, because as long as you get the building blocks in place, and as long as you've got the right connectivity and infrastructure in place, the market will decide where it goes. But what it, what it doesn't have at the minute, and I think what COVID probably is is uh, uncovering something in the north that we've known for a long time, is that the current building blocks and infrastructure aren't in place. And so actually the government can do a lot around that rather than saying, well, you know what, there's going to be a new normal. We all have, an, we all have a view on new normal. I don't think there's going to be a new normal. I think after a vaccine and when we get back to normal, I think people will want to be out with people. I think they'll want to be out meeting people because I think we all want to interact with human uh with humans on a personal level, not just uh, not just over a screen. The other things that I want to see, and I know is particularly uh, important to, to Simon, um, is I think the North, and I think there's two or three regions in the North, and Teesside obviously plays a role in this, um, will take a lead on net zero as well. So I think things like carbon capture technology, hydrogen technology, I think the drive for hitting our 2050 target will be met by that, those former post-industrial towns with large chemical sectors like uh, Cheshire and Warrington, like Teesside, et cetera. They will be the driver for decarbonisation of industry. It's where you will trial the technologies of things like hydrogen cars, hydrogen transport. It's where you will do carbon capture and storage technology because the, the engineering expertise, the skill sets and the businesses already exist. It's the biggest frustration I have with Bayes at the moment is they're trying to come up with what, you know, what does hydrogen look like? Does hydrogen play an important role? And we sit there with ministers and civil servants saying, we've been doing hydrogen for 50 years. 
We've been using it as a feedstock. We've been using it to offset um, our carbon emissions. Use the regions, use devolution to help you inform your, your policy making. And then there was just a very final point because it was another question that came up, but it is an ask as well, is I think uh, something seriously needs to be done about UKRI because UKRI is so skewed, so, so skewed to uh, the Golden Triangle and Cambridge and Oxford. All of the research and innovation monies are just sucked into the South and the Southeast. Um, for example, just to give you a bit of an idea, over the last period, um, the Tees Valley has received eight and a half million pounds of UKRI research and innovation funding. Over the same period, Cambridge and Peterborough received 1.2 billion pounds. You know, that's the disparity. And interestingly enough, the, the recently appointed chief executive of UKRI is a professor from Cambridge University, which is just a self-fulfilling prophecy that they'll continue to fund the old red brick universities instead of looking at the likes of Keele in the North, at the likes of Durham and Teesside and Leeds, who actually do have some really, really good academic uh, ideas that we could spin out into our industrial bases. But it is so Southern focused from a research and development point of view, UKRI. Until that's addressed, I think we will see continue to see real issues of where does funding for research and development actually go? Because it's not coming to the North. Well, lots to go out there. <laughs> lots to go out there. I certainly won't comment on funding for Cambridge for fear of igniting a storm. But what I will say is that, look, I, I mean, what, what has just been set out by uh, Ben and Nicola and uh, Diamond and uh, Susanna all, uh, you know, is, is, is substantially correct. We, of course, need to build the structures, which is the point you were making, Ben, to enable success. And I, like you, don't believe that the state should uh, be too prescriptive in terms of what happens where, when. But my goodness, we should be an enabling state, which makes sure that the potential exists uh, to be realized. And I think uh, the build it and they will come philosophy is the right one. And for those who don't know areas like ours and the sheer lack of investment that has characterized the last 50 years, uh, in not just in terms of the public realm, but in terms of, as you say, things like uh, R, you know, R and I and R and D, the the truth is we we have been substantially left to fail and it's no surprise if the state doesn't support you that you have less uh less impressive outcomes so that needs to change uh more broadly clearly and this goes to Susanna and Anna's point that we we need to look at getting a good deal with the European Union if we possibly can uh we know that the talks uh, are ongoing this week there's another round at the end of September and then there's the crucial EU summit on the 15th of October, which I think is widely recognised to be, in essence, the uh, the hard stop for any chance of a negotiated deal. It is really important, I think, that the Europeans understand that whilst we are sincere in wanting a deal, whether it be on fishing, state aid or a level playing field, there are limits to how far this country will move. We are a sovereign nation, again, reflecting uh, the democratic mandate, not just of the referendum, but of last year's general election. And it has to be understood that this is not the same government that caved in uh, in the face of their obduracy uh, under Theresa May. And therefore, there will need to be substantial movement on their part if they are to uh, get a deal. We are willing to be good partners in that process, but it does take two uh, to tango. Uh, I think the other thing I would say is that in terms of what we need to get out of these trade deals, is, is, that, is that truly global folk? I mean, the European Union matters enormously. It is a gradually declining market. It is now down uh, to around 45% of our trade and progressively falls with each year that goes by. We do need to look at opening up those good trade deals, as, as was alluded to, with the likes of the United States, Japan, Canada, and lots of countries, including crucially the emerging economies who are going to dominate the rest of the century. My final point would just be that I believe that the story of the 21st century is, of course, the gradual eclipse of the traditional West and the rise of new new powers and new players. And I think one of the best reasons for Britain to have left the European Union is precisely so that we can innovate to succeed in this new world where India will be sending millions of highly educated and ambitious young people into the workforce every year, where South Korea will be doing likewise, where the economies of Latin America and Africa will be doing the same. If we don't get ourselves match fit for that, then we are going to suffer relative decline that's the big challenge which underlies all of this, and that's why it matters so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Minister. And uh, I, I would say to people on the negotiations, uh, 
darkest hour is just before the dawn. I think there are great things to come. Now, in the last few minutes remaining to us, I'm going to rattle through some of these brilliant questions that have come in and um, and ask people to respond. Um, first of all, one for you, I think, uh, Nick, and then we will go directly to, to Simon and, and and then we will move on to the next question. I think Ben would have something to say, but we are just running low on time. Um, what's, can we say today, Nick, what the ideal interplay would be between the shared prosperity and the devolution white paper? And then, and then maybe uh, Simon could comment briefly more, I think, on we're very, we know you can't tell us what's in there, but we're very keen to hear when some progress will be made. Nick. <laughs> Well, if it's not too too nerdy and technical, clearly the UK SPF should all be devolved to um, a pan-regional body that's strong enough to be accountable for it, whether that's through mayoralty's LEPs or any other. Um, and the devolution of that fund should be in order is should be um, allocated by the leaders of the North. That is, you know, if that's not too uh, clear. Uh, let's see if we get that. Um, <laughs> and then the next question, which is, uh, show us the money, basically. And, and and as you very well know, I've been, you know, begging bowl or tambourine. I'll I'll do any of them, but it is about quantum of investment as well as the devolution of that money. So um, we want a lot, and we want it devolved. Okay. Um, thanks, Nick. And it sort of picks up on the next question in the list, which is about how can the UK government ensure that structural funds are delivered to the North of England. This is all wrapped up, Minister, with the government's devolution white paper. I was there um, uh, well over a year ago now when the Prime Minister said, yeah, what we want to see is devolution across the North of England. I know that you and your team have been working on this. Perhaps you could give us a, 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 a taster. Uh, well, we do, need to, uh, we do need to answer that challenge. And uh, rest assured that we will, because there's a manifesto committed that no part of the UK will be uh, left any the worse off uh, as a result of uh, the fact that we're leaving uh, the EU Structural Funds Programme and setting up our own uh, our own UK Share Prosperity Fund. I think that's a vital tool for enabling the kind of regeneration that we all want to see. The full details of that and how it will operate will be confirmed following the cross-government spending review, which the Chancellor is currently uh, conducting. That's obviously vital in terms of uh, making sure that this sits within uh, the, you know, the, the, the widest possible context, because it is a very substantial uh, sum of money that we're talking about here. Clearly, you are right. Uh, we want to see a very, uh, a very strong push towards maximum uh, input from the devolved parts of uh, England, just as obviously we also want to respect the devolution settlement across the United Kingdom. That's a sensitive one, because we also want to make sure that the UK government itself uh, is is reflected and represented in those conversations. And we are a unionist party. And in particular, obviously, we need to be conscious of how we bind our country together in the face of Scottish nationalism in particular. So there are there are all sorts of conversations to be had around that. But decisions will be announced uh, this autumn on this. The good news is, of course, that a lot of these programmes run uh, until 2022 or 2023, which actually gives us in practice more time than it might appear in order to build out that new system. But rest assured, we will be providing total clarity this autumn so that very important planning decisions can be made. Uh, in terms of, you referenced briefly the uh, Northern Powerhouse growth body, we're obviously at the pan-regional partnerships, which will work at a level above mayors, is a very interesting dimension of the white paper that's coming up. We do want to see uh, structures in place which can address those issues which span multiple mayoralties, which do, for example, affect the whole of the North. And there are obviously projects which would fall into that category. We'll also be setting out our thoughts on how those will operate uh, as part of the uh, the white paper too. And uh, I would just emphasize for Ben and for all other mayors, not looking to duplicate or indeed erode their powers. We're looking to do something which is genuinely additional. So Ben, there's nothing to be afraid of, I promise. Well, thank you, Lisa. We will wait for the autumn white paper, although my experience in government is that autumn can be so you can go until mid-June. Um, uh, I'm going to finish out and ask all of the colleagues uh, on, on the call to comment about this. I, I think we are clearly living in very unusual times. And one of the things I've been particularly struck by, of course, we've seen it this week, is the differential approach mm -hmm. to things like quarantine, economic recovery, when it comes to tackling the coronavirus. 
Um, of course, many people across the north of England would look at decisions being made in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and would gently point out that the north of England on its own has an economy bigger than all of those countries combined. In fact, there are more people living in the north than all of those devolved parliaments have. So is devolution enough? Has the coronavirus taught us that what we really want is a a Northern Parliament, what is the ultimate destination in terms of structure to empower the North of England? Um, is devolution enough? Do we need a Northern Parliament or do we in fact maybe need an English Parliament uh, and move to a more federal country? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I just, it's one of those questions that people have been putting throughout this pandemic, well, you know, if, if Scotland can take a differential approach or Wales or Northern Ireland, how come the North of England was locked down mm. in March when in truth we had a very low infection rate for coronavirus at the time and it was a real spike that we saw in London. Now, of course, mm. it was the same approach that countries across Europe mm. took. We weren't an outlier in that. Um, and I, I wonder, uh, Dermot, if we may come to you first for your views on that and then Susanna and Nick and Ben and then we'll finish with the Minister and then I'll make some concluding remarks. Uh, it's a very, very interesting question, Jake. Um, I mean, I do think and just one thought that immediately comes to mind is I, I think one issue with the way the UK operates is it is so focused on Westminster that the further away you are, the more there is a feeling of disconnect. And, I, and I, one thing that it, for, me, for me kind of kind of illustrates this is when the BBC moved part of its um, operations to, to be headquartered in Manchester. I certainly just noticed in listening to the radio that there was more of a reflection of what was happening in the north. So I, I do think things like, and it's been suggested before, and I, I think there's a lot of resistance to it, but you know, rotating parliaments or parts of parliaments up to the north, I think I think could have a big impact on on kind of helping rebalance what I think is currently quite an unbalanced system in favour of the south of the country. Thank you, Susanna. What, do you have a, a view on this? Uh, yeah, I, I, I also agree with uh, that point of view, and especially from a trade point of view. Uh, if we look at the last four years, 2016-19, the northern, the northwest specifically, uh, in terms of goods, we actually were the only region in the whole UK that actually contracted their exports. I think that we need more tailored um, uh, activities that will push that forward. I think Ben mentioned earlier about uh, making a bit of competition between the regions. But we all will look into a specialize and, um, and make investments where it really matters to the region where the impact is going to go. So we definitely, I think, a greater devolution uh, should be uh, in, in, in mind uh, to enable that growth and to balance, which that was the, the principle of the Northern Powerhouse uh, anyways, which is balance the economy between the South and the North. So definitely want to, to really push uh, from, from our side. Nick, I'll bring you in. I think uh, Ben and, 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 and uh, Susanna, uh, uh, when you talk about this competition between the reasons, how, you know, how, what structure we need, do we need to achieve that? Or is it a fiscal lever? For example, things like a variable income tax rate or hypothecation of things like uh, road duty to regions which they need to drive their economy. Oh, you know how to excite me. Hypothecation in the morning. I love a bit of it. So um, just a couple of thoughts. My mentor, uh, Professor Alan Harding, he always says no country has ever become federal by mistake. It's a very purposive strategy to decentralize power. And um, I, I'm sure my previous colleagues in the department won't be surprised to hear that my view is that devolution has been far too piecemeal and far too weak. I think that uh, the leadership shown by Ben and others have demonstrated they're ready for more. However, and if I may, I, apologies, I mean, it's awful to be invited to a party and then punch everybody in the nose just before you leave. I feel that when you were Minister Jake, it was very much north, north, north. We created cases, exceptionalism for the Northern Powerhouse, and we kept a momentum around there was transformational potential in the north. And I feel that more recently, that 
there seems to have been more of a focus on sort England out, everywhere needs structures. And whilst I, I get that, of course, the, the case that the North is special and different, I really hope gets reflected because if we have to wait to um, allow housing for Bristol before we can get moving in the North, we lose a lot of the advantage that we've built up and the structures and the relationships and the networks. So what I would say is that don't allow a focus on the governance of England to, to uh, be the only focus because there is a, a discrete Northern difference, which is that we're up for this, we're ready to go. Um, so apologies for all of that. Fantastic, thank you. Let's hear a brief bit of North, North, North from the Mayor of the Tees Valley before we administer the opportunity to do his concluding remarks. Thanks, Jake. I mean, the only thing I would say on uh, devolution and where things should go, and I bang, I, say, I bang this drum all the time and I'll continue to say it, is I don't want to replace London with Manchester. So pan-northern bodies, you know, I like the idea as a concept, but, you know, is it going to take powers away from me? Because, again, the issue we've got is I don't want Whitehall just to say, well, let's give everything to transport for the north that happens to be in Manchester and in Andy Burnham's offices at uh, the Combined Authority for Greater Manchester. That takes away power from me. And I also think if there's devolution, devolution, especially where power sits, needs to be outside of our major cities because our cities are not reflective of the north. I love Manchester. Manchester's a great place. This isn't a dig at Manchester because it's the same for Leeds. It's the same for Birmingham. People need to move away from cities because the impact and the effect on cities is not the same problems that we face in the rest of the country. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, I think there is now more of a focus on, you know, what do we do to level up? Because levelling up Teesside is a very different question to levelling up Manchester and what we don't want or are the same ideas, the same policymakers with the same thought, um, you know, the thought process who would be in London or just in Manchester and still don't understand the demands of our towns, our small towns and our villages which means that we're left behind even more. So let's not replace big cities in London with big cities in the North. Thank you, Ben. Minister. Oh, man, uh, I agree. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that's clearly right, Ben. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, much as we want our northern cities to thrive and there's much to do there, uh, the North and indeed much of the rest of the country is obviously not a city economy and not a city society. And uh, one of the things we must do, I think, is change how we think about uh, the UK outside London and specifically England outside London and the greater South East. I think one of the best things we can do, and I'm optimistic the government is going to make uh, dramatic progress on this, is to ensure that our own internal discussion is better reflected of the nation we serve. And a large part of that, I think, would be about making sure that the people who actually make so many of the most important decisions are exposed to the challenges which confront our region. And that does mean, I think, the large scale uh, redeployment of parts of the civil service and the ministers uh, in those departments to other parts of the UK outside London. This is a, a nettle which I think needs to be grasped. I think would make a real difference, actually, rather than a token one. You can. You can take the legislature on chore. You can have a cabinet away day. That's not the answer. The point is, you've got to confront people uh, who are making the decisions that matter with the reality of the roads, the schools, the hospitals, the, the job opportunities outside the most successful parts of the United Kingdom. And that, I think, is what would make the biggest single difference to uh, make, you know, making sure that levelling up is imprinted across government. Uh, in terms of the question of a Northern Parliament or any indeed an English Parliament, I'm not in favour. I, I believe that Westminster matters. I, I mean, I, I think having a strong national government matters and actually the balkanisation of the UK is something that worries me, and I, uh, I, you know, I'm horrified at the prospect of uh, Scottish independence. So we must do everything we can, I think, to reaffirm the centrality of the UK and the legitimacy of Westminster. But in so doing, and as an integral part of that work, we must evolve in a meaningful way, and we must move decision making in a meaningful way closer to the rest of the country. I think those two objectives are aligned and highly complementary. Thank you very much. Uh, nothing now remains to um, thank our brilliant panellists, Susanna Dermot, Nicola, Ben, and here with me, Minister Simon Clark. Um, thank you very much to Squires. I think we've had a brilliant discussion this morning. We've really got under the skin of this. We're, of course, going to revisit this when we do more of these webinars. And thank you also to everyone who's been listening for your brilliant questions that have stimulated the debate in an exciting way. Thank you and goodbye.